Okay. All right, cool. All right. So again, appreciate everybody jumping on to do this. We'll try to get out in an hour and 30 minutes or so. But before we do get started, um, since putting this together and just thinking about it and reaching out to everybody, oh, hold on. Gotta, I've been thinking obviously a lot about Mac, a big mentor of mine, and definitely when a, a crew chief comes to mind with him. So just to honor Mac, I just wanted to have like 10 seconds of silence for him because um, I know he would love to be in this room with us and, and share all kind of knowledge. Okay. So just wanted to just, just start with that. Okay. So we'll just give him 10, 15 seconds for just to think about Mac and what he's done for each of us. I have the best 10 count. You want me to go with my 10 count? Yeah. Get the microwave out. Yep. Okay. All right. So um, again, thank you all for, for being here. I'll go a quick intro and we're going to get going. So we have no clips today, zero clips. It's discussion, discussion, discussion. And um, I want everybody to talk. I'm just going to keep it as real as I can. Uh, I don't want someone to be on here unless you don't have, you know, access, you're busy at the house. But if you're able to communicate on here, that's what we need. We need to hear from everybody on here. There's a reason why everybody's in this group um, as far as a bunch of you being crew chiefs all the time. Some of you kind of are crew chiefs every once in a while. And then some of you that are real close and trying to get there. So I think it's going to be a really positive thing. The only way it's going to work is if we hear from everybody. So don't be afraid to get out here again. If you, if you want to be a crew chief, you should be able to get out there and get, get in front of people and talk, um, even if it exposes yourself, but we learn from it. So I really want that. That's the first thing I wanted to talk about. And the main meeting is about, it's about growth. Like all of us can learn from each other, continue to get better. So if we do that, we're all going to come away in this, in this meeting, you know, better referees and just better people. So the, as far as the rules of engagement, um, again, if everybody talks and we don't have, you know, more referees, Marshall, um, then we don't have more referees say dominate, but there's two parts to that, right? I mean, if you don't talk and there's a lot of dead space, then we know referees are going to step in and speak. So if everybody speaks and everyone talks and then that doesn't happen, then we're getting multiple feedbacks from everybody. So that's what I would like for the go. But if more referees speak more than others, that's okay. But I'm putting the onus on the ones that don't speak as much. Like, please, we want to hear from you. Um, again, ask questions or situations that happen because, again, we got no clips. We're not talking about clips. We're just talking about ways we can be better, more consistent as referees. This is not a San Antonio thing. It's nothing. That it's There's other referees here from Corpus and other chapters and other associations. So that's the main purpose of it. Here's what I'm gonna do for the first exercise. So I appreciate everybody that did respond to my email. Really did like it, okay? So got a lot of feedback. So the first exercise I'm gonna put up eight. Basically what I did was I took the majority of people's, um, mute Bill, and um, put down the top eight on there. And then we're just gonna go through them. So the first one is the, you know, the top two qualities it is to be a crew chief. We'll go through those. I'll put them up there. I'll share my screen and then we'll, and again, there's not two, right? There's way more than that, but um, we'll go through those and then we'll get into the other piece, which was the um, ones for a poor crew chief. Okay. So I'm gonna share my screen real quick. It's going to be this one. Okay. So in, in no particular order, I just put the two qualities of a, of a good, this will be a, for a good crew chief. All right. So we've got great play caller, integrity, communicator, confidence, being punctual, courage, patience, and then great physical fitness appearance, all right? So anybody, jump in, spearhead it. You're more than welcome to say what you sent to me and why or touch on anything you want. But I guess what the exercise will be is get down to, as a group, what we feel are probably the top, top two or three on here. Mark, may I kick it off? Sure, thank you. Uh, so I feel all cool right now. Uh, I happen to choose, I chose punctuality and patience, uh, punctuality, because if you're the crew chief, you got to set the example, being to the gym on time, uh, getting to the gym on time, you know, the hour early, 45 minutes of the hour early, get ready for a great pregame, uh, cause pregame is where it starts. Uh, but then punctuality transforms to the court, uh, 
being on the court on time before game time, you know, 15 minutes prior, uh, getting folks out of timeouts, coming back at halftime, uh, just all of that punctuality, getting the ball in bounds. Uh, so punctuality is key. Uh, then leads to patience. Uh, patience with your crew, understanding the dynamic of who you're working with that night, uh, understanding that people have different personalities and being able to work together. Patience with your play calling, then patience with players, the coaches, and patience with your crew, uh, patience in your PCA. And so there's so many other aspects, but those two were the ones, you know, when I got the email, I thought, you know, punctuality and patience because they cover so many aspects uh, during our game. What I, what, what I thought, folks. Good one. Oops, yeah. Sorry. Thanks, thanks, Mike. Anyone, anyone else want to add to it or, or have your opinion? I think, uh, you know, setting the example is probably the best way to put that, both in functionality and in patience. Um, like Mike said, you know, as a crew chief, we got to be able to set the example for the for your for your co-officials. Um, I I had mentioned being a, a great communicator. You know, communication goes along with what Mike said. Being there, ready for the ready for the um, for the pregame. You know, and it's not just saying what you want done. It's it's getting buy-in from your from your partners. You know, it's 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 communication both ways. It's accepting and giving. Um, you know, communicating with the coaches, communicating uh, communicating with the players. You know, all that goes hand in hand with setting that example, as Mike said. So that, that that's where I kind of went with that. Appreciate it, Dwayne. Anyone anyone else want to hop in? Let me let me piggy, piggyback a little bit on what Dwayne said about communicator, and when he talked about. I think it starts from you get a game assignment, you accept it in a timely manner, you communicate with your crew prior to, so you have, you know if somebody potentially is gonna be late or right there on time. And then as Dwayne said, when he talked about players and coaches, communication, we communicate equally. If, if you're gonna communicate with one coach, you're gonna communicate with the other coach on an equal and level footing or it looks that way more importantly i guess so it doesn't look like you're communicating to one and not the other um same way with players not coaching them but communicating them we talk to them at the pregame saying hey if we're talking to you we're trying to help you i think when we do that we got to make sure that it's even past pregame and it's throughout the game uh communicate not coaching but i think from time you get the game Till post game, from a communication standpoint, doing a good post game goes a long way, whether it's the crew chief or the crew. Thanks, Frank. Anyone else? Hey, Mark. Hey, David. Hey, uh, just to piggyback on the patience, you know, I think as as crew chiefs, you know, communication and patience are so important for those those referees that's with you that, that, that are trying to get to that next level. And sometimes I feel like if you're, if you're, if you're coming off as I'm better than you, it never works. So you always have to have patience with referees that might not see things the way you see, may not have great play calling, but it's, it's a great way to develop them by having that patience, you know, by, by, by talking about the, you know, going through the first three great things they did and then getting to the, hey, we could have did this better. You know, it's kind of that five positives before you put one negative in mm -hmm. that will develop uh, the other referees around us. Yeah, agreed. Any, anyone else? Hey, Mark. Hey, Bob. Hey, I, I looked at it as from the educator point of view, right? And trying to always like, go into, you know, what, they, what uh, Frank was saying about calling beforehand. Uh, making sure you accept the game on time and uh, or accept the game right away, call your partners, do the right things, demonstrate the right things. But then when you get there and you're at the game, having the conversation where it's okay in the pregame, turn it over to your co-officials. Allow them to do the pregame. Jump in where you can. Help build them up. Give them confidence that, oh, wow, he's letting me do this pregame. Okay, let me, let me do the pregame. You can tell them in advance. And then, like, out on the court, like, it's those pieces that when they make a, a tough call, 
letting them know, hey, great call. Hey, doing, you know, and it's being where you're willing to build up that official. I'll also have the conversation when they, when we need to have a conversation about things we can do better, but then also being humble enough to say, what do you got for me? Like, what can you share with me and do this? And, and so that way, like you're trying to build confidence among them, but also um, showing them that you want to learn too. You're not above everybody else. You're not, you know, this or that. You, you might have more years experience. You might've done this longer, but like we can learn from everybody and I'm going to help you get better and bring you up to where I'm at. Yep. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. Any, anyone else? Or, or even someone that maybe is not a crew chief every night that is wanting to be one. What do you feel? You know, you've been a part of pre-games and not, not been an R, but dealt with several people being referees. Any feedback or things that you see? Hey, Mark, that's me. Uh, this is Brian. Brian Stinkler, everyone. I'm, I'm uh... I'm typically a U1 or a U2 and, and, and been, a, been an R for, for just a handful of games. And uh, one thing that I've noticed uh, from the good R's that I've worked with is, is I've heard the word communication, communicator from everybody that I've spoken so far. And we gotta have transparency. Um, it, it's a must. And, and I think in order to be a good leader, um, you gotta be a good communicator. And that's something I've learned. That's something I've picked. I've picked certain little things off of certain individuals um, and I, I think that's uh, that's vitally important for for ours to to lead by example of, of being a communicator. And and uh, Bob just talked about being humble. Um, humility is very good. Um, a good leader, in my opinion, is 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 always selfless and is thinking about his his or her followers. Um, and we must remain humble so you one and you two will will grow and will learn and 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 uh, and grow off of 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 the ours because the ours are. are is this is the is the rock of, of our chapter um so uh i, I think transparency is huge and, and humility is huge so i appreciate everyone uh, all the help throughout the last seven eight years um a lot of you guys are on this call and, and pre appreciate all your uh, all your input and feedback hey mark thanks brian yep on the communicator side uh you know i've been blessed to to work with some great veteran officials uh and the thing about the veterans is it's about the crew and it's about the chapter. You know, it's not about them. You know, they let it be known, hey, there's an R by my name, but we're in this game together. We're all R's. Uh, you know, Kenny Belafonte, I love his voice when he's always saying that. Every, I'm an R every night. Uh, being humbled enough to own a mistake and admit a mistake, you know, being able to accept feedback the same way that they give it uh, and just being open you know, that communication piece to, to know that you kicked a call and your crew chief being able to get you back before that wheel falls off. You know, they see it, they know it when it's coming and being able to communicate that. The great ones that are in our chapter, they don't just speak it, they, they show it by example. And it commands, a, it, it commands such a respect when someone brings you something that they literally abide by and live by. And so that communication piece is, oh man, it's, it's vital. Agreed. Um, okay. So as you see, I highlighted communicator. I think that's number one. I think that's the common denominator that everybody's saying is being a great communicator. I agree. That was my number one. That's the one that I picked. Uh, let's get into which one we think is number two. I think Reggie, I think you are. Yeah, go ahead, Reggie. I'd like to add one in. And no, one talk, no one's talking about this. Uh, the one thing that I've learned, uh, I know when, when, when my college supervisor challenged me uh, to be better uh, is uh, ownership. Ownership to me mean, means uh, when things go bad, when we have a wrong call or we have something that happens on during the game, doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be the referee's mistake. But uh, I guess it leans on, on to uh, courage as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but ownership to me is owning up to mistakes. Uh, if we miss a call uh, and the coach asks ask you about that call, uh, yeah, coach, you know, I missed that one. You know, we can't use that too much. But having, having the fortitude to, to admit to mistakes, uh, when, the, when a supervisor or the president of the chapter or whatever calls you and asks you about a specific game, 
I, instead of trying to make a story, story up, you know, or try to make an excuse for a wrong call or whatever, or, or, or a travesty of a game, uh, having the fortitude to, to say that, yeah, we made this mistake and this is why we made it. Uh, and this is what we can do to, uh, to not make that mistake again. So I would, I would kick it up to ownership. And the other one I would add on to leadership is being a good follower. Being a good follower, it doesn't matter if you you one, you two, or whatever. You you got to be able to uh, to hear you hear your crew, understand your crew, listen listen to them when when they have uh, input, and don't dismiss. So in order to be a great leader, I think you have to be a great follower as well. That means if I'm working with Marshall, I'm able to kick back and be a number two that day and let Marshall take the lead. I'm able to follow Marshall. I think a good, good, uh, a good leader is a good follower as well. That's all I'm going to say. Agree. Thanks, Reggie. Um, okay, so I added that one um, ownership. I, I had communication and humility. Those were my number twos, but I, no one else had put that, so I don't want to add that. But I'm going to kind of put that in the same. But I like that. I like ownership a lot. Uh, anyone else want to piggyback on that or touch on any of these other ones? Kind of touch on courage a little bit. Um, great play calling get into physical fitness, those type things, um, or anybody else want to touch on it? Okay. I did. I ain't uh, Mark, let me okay, just say something about courage. I yep. think for, for some of the officials that may be on here that are, that are looking to move and be the, the crew chief more frequently or, or and, and attain their goals. I think sometimes, and it goes to the to the follower that Reggie was talking about. Sometimes, if you're not the name on the top and you're not the R, as as a U1 or a U2, have the courage to speak up. You have information to give part of the three man or sometimes the two man crew. Have the courage to speak up. Sometimes, um, as officials are coming up, they may not. They may be intimidated a little bit. So I think courage just overall as an official um, is very important. It may be more important as a crew chief, but even if you're the U1, U2, and you got 10 years and the other guy has 35 years, we're not checking cards at the door. We're just three officials, part of the crew. We want to get things right. So one, have the courage to speak up, but I think then the crew chief has to have the courage to take that information and sometimes make a decision, if it's the crew chief making the decision, based upon someone else's information. And that may be back to the humility standpoint, but I think courage goes across whether you're the crew chief or you're the, the, the up and comer or whatever it is to, you have information, share it. What someone does with that information is up to them, but, but don't leave the court at the end of the, at the, end of the game and you had information to share that could have changed the outcome. I'll just leave it at that. Okay, uh, Bill, I think you're unmuted. Bill, you wanna say something? Hello? Hey, Bill. Yeah, um, I think what we also have to remember is that uh, a good part of uh, being a good communicator is a good listener and piggybacking on what was just said. Um, we often think that some questions are silly, right? Well, what are you going to be working on tonight? Well, if we're going to develop officials and we're hearing from the younger official or the inexperienced official that, hey, I need to work on this or I need help with this, right? Uh, let's not consider it a deficit. It's an opportunity for us to grow as well as that individual. And uh, we have that opportunity during the preseason and scrimmages to do it. but. Um, we have to we have to establish that that idea that I will listen to you, okay? Because your information is just as meaningful as mine. I've just been lucky enough to be around it a little bit longer. Thanks, Bill. Um, I'm gonna email all of you. I just went to my notes. There's an article on referee.com, and it's it, and it's what it really means to be a crew chief, and it's a really long article. But I do recommend everybody to go look at it 
Um, it, it talks mostly about NBA referees and their stories of them growing up, how they became crew chiefs and those type of things. But we'll dive into that later. But I'll get you that link um, for y'all to look at. So what I have right now is I have, I have communicator and ownership humility as our, as our top ones. All right. So that's a great conversation. I'm going to dive into now a poor crew chief. Um, this shouldn't take too long, um, but just to bring some awareness to things that we may not be aware of, that we may be doing that we don't know, just to go through those. And then maybe we can get into some in-game situation type stuff. No films, but just talking about how we can handle um, certain, certain situations that may arise. Let me bring this up. Is this one right here? Okay. Hopefully y'all can see this. Okay, so these are the ones that were on a poor crew chief that came up were me versus we, mentally selfish, similar, right? Uh, well, I should say bad communicator, apologies. A bad communicator, combative, unable to teach, lack of trust, not open to feedback, and too friendly to coaches. So let's try to go someone we haven't heard from that wants to take a stab at maybe their top two on this list or maybe others that are not on it. Hey, Mark, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, Ron. Hi, this, is Ron this is Ron Van Laningham. Um, on this one, I put, I, I, I'm glad I made the top eight. I didn't make the There you go. I'm not <laughs> upset about that. But uh, uh, I, I had combative because, um, you know, when you're, you're in a game, uh, you know, uh, I'm one of the guys that uh, – uh, I'm not always there. are. I'm usually you one and you two. And so if you have a, a crew chief um, that is, is combative, uh, it, so yeah, on the, uh, on the good, let's go back to that. I put personable as a, a quality because I think if you have relationships with, with the guys on the court that you're working with, and with the coaches, not backslapping relationships, but just they understand you, you understand them. They built up trust in you. Same applies to your partner. So if you have a combative partner, uh, the chemistry in that game is going to go bad. Your focus is going to go down. And I think that, you know, you run into a lot of problems with that. Uh, everybody's been in a game where either you're with a person that, that uh, you, you've had some beefs with or – uh, you have two people that are going at each other and you're the third person looking in. And if you probably look at those games, looking back at those games, I don't know if anyone can say that they went very well. Uh, so if you have a, com it, and this applies to all three, if any one of them are combative, uh, uh, conceited and, and aren't there to help the team, then it's just going to be a bad apple, and, and a lot of times that leads to bad games. Thanks, Ron. Um, anyone else want to jump in? Yeah, well, Mark. Jay, Jay Moore, go ahead, man. Yeah, uh, I'm, you know, being selfish, uh, you know, sometimes we just forget it's not about us. You know, we're out there to – do the best possible job, work for the kids, give the kids uh, our best game, our best effort, uh, and, and not make it about, about yourself. They're not there to watch us. We're just there to do our best to call it as we see it. And that, that's really all I got. Okay. And I think we've heard a lot, right, that um, the game comes first, Right. And then the crew and then us individually last. That's been something that I've learned at many camps and we've heard a lot of that. So I, t I totally agree with that. Um, anyone else? Marvin. Hey, hey Marvin. Uh, to piggyback with uh, Ron, not open to feedback kind of matches the combative aspect where I see that uh, officials are they're not really combative, but they sure aren't open to feedback sometimes. Uh, which really is a detriment to the crew and it's a detriment to individuals deciding who they want to work with or not want to work with. So that, that's a huge issue with our officials. So I, I tie those two together. I'm not so sure it's, it's as 
combative, but not open to feedback. Okay, thanks, Marvin. Any, anyone else? Hey, Mark. Reggie, what's up? Um, you know, a couple of these I, I can understand. The, the me versus we, the bad communicator. Uh, but some of these are, are foreign to me, and I don't know if it's just me or, or I don't know. But I don't understand. I don't understand. I need examples because I don't understand selfish. I don't understand combative. And I don't understand not open to feedback. I don't understand those three as far as I can understand why they would be bad. Mm -hmm. But in my experience, uh, working with crew chiefs and whatever, I never, I've, don't think about it, I've encountered those words, any of those. So I just need examples of guys that have, that have experienced that. Maybe they, maybe they've experienced it with me. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, I just need some examples of that because I can't put that into a game. I, I can't see it. Okay, so I'll, I'll let people speak. The way that I did it was, I know Ron said he, he didn't make the top eight. It wasn't the top eight that I felt were the top eight. It was the ones that the most I got back that I put out there. So if I, you know, combative was there a couple of times, something similar to that, selfishness or unable to teach, like those, those were ones that were being, you know, commonly coming up. So that's why I put them on there. So, um, and if anybody wants to speak on them that wrote, that sent those to me, they can, or if anyone wants to kind of give a better understanding, then, then, then go for it. Yeah, so can I talk, take that uh, one? I think to me being competitive, you know, would be, I mean, we're, we're all human, right? We're all gonna make mistakes, uh, but, but owning up to this make those mistakes, it goes back to the ownership that Reggie had mentioned earlier. Um, nobody's perfect, uh, but at the same time, if it's pointed out to you in trying to defend uh, what maybe you were saying or what what you were doing, you know, even though it doesn't really have a defense to go with it, that that's being to me that's being combative. Okay, Kenny. Yeah. So so when I when when I see like what Reggie was saying, I when I look at this list and I say, man, what man have I showed any of those qualities at, at some point in my uh, time is being official and I have to say man yeah there's been a couple times um, and I think so when I evaluate that for myself like how does that happen um, it it happens because maybe I don't trust maybe I haven't forgiven right so those are the kind of things that I think um, okay what would make me combative yeah uh, maybe I don't maybe I think I should be the crew chief um, in the past when I'm working for this person I'm not working for him but how did this guy get to be a crew chief over me that's what I'm thinking. Um, and so I have, to, I have to combat that in myself to, to say, okay, um, it's really not about that person's over me, uh, but it really is just the assign, you know, the way the assignment worked out for that night. Um, but as I, as I really, as I take a look at this, uh, it just to me tells me, man, to be a better crew chief, you gotta know, you gotta see these things, or if you see those things in yourself, you have to be able to, uh, be accepting. You don't have to tell the world. You can just tell Jesus, <laughs> and and uh, but you have really just say it to yourself in the mirror and say, okay, if this is what I see, then what do I need to do to change it? If I if I can say something, Kenny, along those lines, I think I thought about this when this popped up too, and I kind of thought through myself on the the times that I may have been a crew chief. I think this may have come back when in and give an example is if you're the crew chief and you go in at halftime and you dissect the, the first half and a younger official, less experienced official up and comer asks you a question as a crew chief and asks you, Hey, what'd you see in this and that? Sometimes the crew chief, a more experienced official, and it doesn't have to be the crew chief. It could be just a more experienced official takes that as a, why is the young guy questioning me? And, and it, that happens, and I wish we – I would have asked that question two weeks ago when we were doing the – with the NBA guys of, hey, when you were an up-and-comer, how would you ask Joey Crawford how he made that call in the first quarter and how would you handle it? So, so sometimes I think as a veteran, we, have, we may have a tendency that when someone asks us that is not – not equal is not the proper but doesn't have as much – of what we think is experience, then we may get defensive as opposed to combative. 
but we put up a shield and we lock everything out and then we become a bad communicator because we're not going to talk about it. Why is that person asking me about a call that was my call or a no call? So that's the thing that popped into mind is um, of how it could be combative is somebody approached you, they may not be thought of at, on the same level or same scale as you in your mind or somebody else's mind. And you become defensive and say, why are you asking me that? I, I had a good look or whatever it may be. So that's the example I would give on combative um, or even defensive. Why are you questioning me, young buck? I'm the veteran here. You're not on, on whether you're the coochie or not. That's, I'll just throw that in there. Okay. Um, Mike, go and, ahead, Daniel. And Mark? Yeah. Uh, Mike Daniels is going to go. Who is that? And then Bill, you're next. I got you next, Bill. So go All ahead, right. Mike. Uh, <clears throat> Reggie, to, to answer, you know, you, you asked like for examples in regards to combative and selfish. Uh, I've been blessed. I've been the young guy that's you one and you two a lot of times, but I've been blessed to work with a lot of great R's. And so I've seen great R's and I've seen not so great R's, right? And so when we're talking about selfish, selfish is something as simple as not responding in arbiter, you know, about an upcoming game. You know, when we're putting notes and not responding in Arbiter. Selfish is showing up to a varsity contest, a district varsity contest, 10 minutes before. Now, mind you, I know things happen. It happens to us all. I get it. But, you know, that's a part of selfish. Selfish is you don't like this guy and you're coming into that game with that mentality about this guy and not thinking about the game. Combative. We pregame. Hey, when we have an atypical situation, no matter if it's a simple common technical foul, slow down and talk to somebody. You as a young guy jump in front of that veteran, that veteran takes their hands and shoves you out the way, and they're just head storming to the table, combative. Because now that young guy that is trying to do the right things and make sure things are adjudicated properly, keep the crew intact, now that young guy is going to sit back and just stay in his PCA, stay in his lane, and not want to intervene anymore. So when you talk about selfish and combative, those are specific examples uh, with that, that have experience and, 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 and I've seen, I've been, I've been a part of, you know? Thanks, Mike. Uh, go ahead, um, Bill, Bill Zubicki, go ahead. Yeah, um, rather than unable to teach, uh, I see an awful lot of unwilling to teach. Uh, I hope this discussion is not just directed to varsity assignments because there are many of us in this group that should be doing sub varsity or middle school games with those younger officials to get them into the right pathway and if we just put on the attitude which many have done in the past that they're there just to collect a paycheck <clears throat> that they really aren't concerned about the growth of the younger official and or they'll buy off with, oh, everything you did is okay. And then you see that same official three and four games later and he's had officials like this as ours and they haven't taken an interest. I think you, you, to a degree, since the perfect game has never been called, you do have to have an interest in your team that night that you're going to get as close to that as possible. And that's at any level. But we have to be able to say, let's, if you, if you got a, a something, you know, maybe you can teach me something. But for the most part, if you're a senior R and you're working with an inexperienced official, you are doing them and your crew short change if you don't bring an experience and a rule, a rule mentality in there. And maybe we're just embarrassed because referees don't bring rule books and officials manuals to games. That's all, thank you. Hey, I wanna piggyback real quick on Bill. That right same on. thing with building up is, hey, after the game, how many of y'all when you work with a new official or somebody who's come in and you were really impressed with them, pick up the phone and call Marvin or send Marvin a text to say, Hey, this guy can go, Hey, give me more games with this guy. I want to work with them. I want to do, you know, that's that, the, you know, you have the opportunity to take on people. And so when you say the selfish, it's, 
hey, take on someone, do this, act, help them come up because somebody helped you along the way um, to do that. So, yeah, good point. Hey, Mark, can I add something? This Ron. Go, yeah, go ahead, Ron. Uh, just to circle back to Reggie, it, it, that Reggie, that wasn't a, like a singular reference, but and I personally haven't been in a game where someone's been combative towards me, but I have been in games when my partners have been combative towards each other. And from the outside looking in, the chemistry in that games and those kind of types of games, when you have some two people that for some reason are going are being combative towards each other it, that ends up uh, being bad chemistry on the floor game flows bad no communication uh, they usually become silent uh, because they're they're ticked off at their partner and so I've been on the outside looking in and uh, it, it's very I mean this is the thing that's very common in our chapter I mean but the games that has, has happened it has been such a detriment to the game and to the officials working that game. And it just it ended up being a bad experience. So that's why I put that as a, as a hire. And it's not really related directly to our chapter because I work like summer games and stuff. Everybody else works with other people. But when you have a combative or uh, adversarial relationship, if anyone in that crew does, it's, uh, it's tough to work that game with them. And, uh, you know, I know that the assignment crew, probably has to ferret through some of that stuff. But uh, and again, it isn't a big thing where I see it all the time. Uh, it's maybe, you know, four or five games I've been in, but I just know that after that game, I felt bad. I didn't, I felt like we didn't have a good game. I, I didn't have any fun. Uh, and uh, the coaches pick up on it. Uh, sometimes the fans can pick up on it and the players can pick up on it. So that's, that's, uh, I just want to clarify that. And uh, Mark, on the top eight comment, I was just kidding, man. I know, I know you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think Ron, Ron makes a, a a really good point uh, that you know a lot of times when we're when we're talking about uh, like I I remember the most I was impressed by this, another association is I watched some some guys from Houston and I was in their locker room and man and I talked with Marshall about this earlier uh, I watched these guys like go at one another and and they weren't. I mean, they weren't nice, probably borderline professional, but man, I, I watched when they finished um, and it, it spoke to their, their, their culture is that when they were finished, it really was done. Um, and they, I watched them because we went out to eat afterwards. They're giving each other a hard time. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're laughing and joking, but they, they had, I'm sure that didn't come just like they talked about that today and it happened tomorrow, but it took, people taking risks, saying things that they probably weren't comfortable in saying, um, and for that person to be accepting of things that they probably didn't really want to accept at first. Uh, and so that's what I've been most impressed by. Uh, that's that crew that I, I remember. And, and, and I saw it like out of two or three, it was two sets of crews on a weekend. So I got to see that it was consistent amongst that, that the, the folks that I saw. I'll, uh, I want to piggyback on that, but I was going to talk on it later, but it kind of makes more sense to bring about it now. Um, Mac would say this if he was here, we would talk about this a lot. So Mac would always talk about the culture um, of other cities. So he would talk a lot about Dallas and Houston and Austin because he would work with a lot of those referees in college, All right? So he'd always tell me that we need to, as San Antonio, this is going, this is going to talk about San Antonio, even though we have some other referees on here but it can be at any association. So the corpus people in here, I mean, you can take this with you. Mac would always say that we need to be more competitive with one, with like get a group. Like he always said, that Dallas has about 20 to 25 referees that are highly competitive and they push each other. They're pushing each other, pushing each other. And um, yeah, they argue a lot, but there's love, right? To Kenny's point, there's love, but they know if they're either working a game together, working after or before, that if they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, they're, they're going to hear it. But it's competitive. But they were pushing each other so much. And guess who ends up growing? All of them. From the, 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 the least experienced to the veteran. They would, and, and this is something that I, we always talk about culture change. This is something that we, I think we can do better at. And we, we can do it. We can do this where if all 
this is crew chiefs, right? Most of us are crew chiefs, going to be crew chiefs, want to be crew chiefs. If we take a stand and hold everybody accountable and we are highly competitive, right? Because we all want to get to state. Don't get it twisted. We all want to get the playoff games. We all want the big games every night, right? But there's not enough to go around. But if we're highly competitive and we push each other, then when that person does get that game, then we're happy for them. We're not salty about it because we know that we've all pushed each other and helped each other get to the games that we all want, right? So that's as I'm glad you touched on it. Kenny, I was going to touch on it later, but I thought that'd be the best kind of um, time to bring it in. I know Marshall and Reggie, you guys talked to Mac a lot about it as well. Mac was a guy that was really, you know, we call him Applebee's Mac. We joke about it. If you ever go to Applebee's with Mac, he would have all this knowledge for you. Just be crazy. You just sit there and just be like, oh my God, you just could never stop learning from this guy. But he wasn't always out there. Like he didn't want to get up in front of the chapter meetings and talk and, and do those type things. But I wanted to share it because I know that's something that Mac would always him. He told me all the time, man, we got to change the culture. We got to be more competitive. We got to push each other. We got to do this. So I don't know, Marshall, Reggie, you want to touch on that? Uh, David, I'll get you next. Um, Reggie, go ahead. Uh, I agree with that. And, I, and uh, rather than say, I'm not competing with anybody, any, anyone, but, uh, but I, I don't sure like to, uh, to challenge. So I, I, I keep that up to challenging. Uh, I know, uh, speaking on Mac, Mac was my pace after, okay? He would challenge me whenever I was in, in a game with him, whenever I wasn't in a game with him. I was still competing or, you know, competing with Mac, trying to trying to catch up with Mac. Okay. That was my pace setter. That was my goal to attain, you know, his status. Okay. So uh, of course that's gonna be a void for me uh this year, uh this upcoming season. But I want to go back to what uh, Ron and just real quick, what Ron and uh Kenny and all the others were saying, and I think uh, with the selfish, combative, lack of trust, unable to teach, not open feedback, bad communicator, all of that, to me, bundles up to a bad partner. So in order to be a good leader, you have to be a good partner. You got to be able to, the me versus we, be able to do the we, we first, you know. Uh, so uh, for me to be a good leader, you have to be a good partner. Agreed. Uh, Marshall, you want to touch on it? I think, yeah, Marshall's in here. Yeah. Hey, guys. I've, I've, been, I've been barbecuing and listening, and uh, it's great conversation. Um, fortunately, unfortunately, I, I kind of fall where Kenny falls, where he says, you know, you look at that stuff, you do the self-assessment, and sometimes you say to yourself, man, that was me, or that was me in that game, or whatever. And if you're not able to give yourself up, and admit to your shortcomings or what occurred in the game, then you, you probably won't grow. The other thing, and this is big, is not carrying stuff from game to game to game. And what happens is you end up building bad relationships, and the bad relationship may just be from one end. Because just like players, you've, you've got to move on to the next game. Um, a lot of – one thing that's mentioned, and I – that was not mentioned or was mentioned, but I don't think was given enough credence is the ability to call plays. Our number one prerogative is to call plays. And that's really where the, the leading by example comes from is accuracy and calling. Because if you call bad, I don't care how great a communicator you are, how uh, good a teacher you are, but if you're, at the end of the day, it's about getting calls right and plays right. Um, and that's the unfortunate part of it because a lot of times we don't have the time during halftime or the beginning of games like you talked about pre-games. Um, let's be honest. If we get a five, ten-minute pre-game in, we're doing good. So a lot of times we don't have the time. And I'm, I know I'm talking about the uncomfortable stuff. We don't have time to talk or have that collaborative discussion. I guess this is where these things help out. Because if you ever go in at halftime, at best you got five minutes to make adjustments or to say, hey, let's stay where we're at. And uh, good leadership and good followership. Reggie made a comment about him following me 
Sometimes Reggie's the R, sometimes Max the R in my games. And, and one of the things I had to do was be a good follower. So first to, step to leadership is followership. And I think a lot of you guys brought that up. But at, at the same time, you know, everybody's not a leader. I hate to say that, but it's true. And everybody's not a follower. And that's true. And that's, you know, so you got to find out where you fit at and be able to style flex at the same time. The ones that are most successful are the ones who can fluctuate between R, U1, U2 without a problem and knowing what they need to do to bring to that game or that situation. Thank you. Well said. Uh, uh, Doc, you want to say something? You got your hand up. Yeah, just real quickly. I, and I, I agree with just about everything everyone said. And going back to what Kenny said and about, you know, the Houston chapter, I, I, maybe I'll throw the question out to the group is how do we get to that point? Because there's so much of, of you know, one thing Mac did, Mac appreciated the people around him and he was always happy no matter what. I just feel we have so many people out after that spend so much time on Arbiter worrying about who got in what game and why game they got like that. And then there's no development. So we can't get to that chapter like Houston where we can, we can develop each other because we have that competitive nature because we go back to that selfish nature to say, well, how did that person get in that game? Why wasn't in that game? So maybe the question now to the group is, how do we grow to that chapter? How do we get away from being so selfish about us? And, and how do we get to the point where we're, we're happy for no matter who's in that game, we're happy for that person. Can I take that, Mark? Yeah, go ahead, Reggie. Hey, uh, Doc. For me, uh, with, with the answer to your question, uh, the first, first way we can get to that is to, uh, number one, when someone comes to you and starts talking to you about plays or could be your plays, could be situations, whatever, uh, number one, we got to understand where that, where that person's heart is coming from. Okay, we have to be open to not only hear the guy, hear the person, but be able to listen. Uh, not immediately become defensive because someone is questioning a play or somebody one is questioning a judgment or whatever. We have to be able to absorb whatever they're, they're coming out with, uh, digesting it, and, 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 uh, and, and if everybody's coming from a good place in their heart, as far as trying to help one another, we can then move forward as to becoming a uh, challenging chapter, rather than what I or what I've experienced some of the time is a defensive chapter. Mm -hmm. I, I I agree. I was about to take it before Reggie, and I think it's the being better, being a better listener, right? So when somebody does come at you about a an assignment. Or why is that person in that game? Or did you hear about that crew and that and that? You know, you hear it a lot, but I think first you listen, right? And then and then I think also this the culture change. I mean, Diana's talked about it. She's trying to change the culture as a new chapter. And I think everybody on this group, I would consider us leaders of this chapter. So if we can all come to common ground and try to change that culture, all that negativity will wash away. You know, that I, I personally want to move with the people that want to move. Right. So the people that are attending Zoom meetings that are that are investing in themselves, that want to train, do all those things. I think if if we continue to do this, right, I think it's we've we've taken advantage of a really bad situation with this COVID stuff. Right. So it's been bad. None of us can get on the court. But I've learned so much from refereeing being off the court. Right. I've learned so much about mental aspects and learning from these NBA referees, even the Zoom meetings we have on Tuesdays and hearing from everybody. If we continue to do this, and the worst thing could happen is we start the season and everyone stays quiet that's on these, that, that do these Zoom meetings, that know what's right, right? And I think if more people step up, I think the culture will change. I think Houston and Dallas, they have more leaders. I don't think that we have enough. I'm just, that's just my personal opinion. So I think if, if we can continue to do that and everybody step up, no matter if you are you know, not that experienced, but you know what's right, what's not wrong, and, and, and the way that we're moving, we're moving you know, I think in a positive direction, um, I think that will, will fix everything because those ones that are negative, they'll, if, if you're negative, what do you want to do? You want to try to find someone that else is negative. Well, if there's no one else that is negative and you come at them and they come back, no, 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 we're not doing that. 
you know, be happy for that person that got that regional game, be happy for that person that got that playoff game, you know, be happy that they got the Antonian Central Catholic game, whatever. If we start thinking about the we instead of me, I think it just changes everything. That's just my personal opinion. Bob, go ahead. Hey, I just want to piggyback on that. And that's like, we've got to be willing when somebody wants to step up or move up from a lower level and they're starting to make that push that, all right, let's go. Come on, let's bring them along and help them get there instead of just what you said at the end of us saying, well, how did that guy get a regional? How did that guy get a playoff game? How did that guy, hey, no, let's be happy for him. And if you really think that guy's not ready yet, well, then let's make a phone call and say, hey, you want to talk? Let's, let's sit down. I want to help you get a little bit better because I want you to make sure you kick the shit out of that game. I mean, being do good in that game. I want to make sure that you're ready for it. You're, you're everything. I'm here to help you. What can I do to help you out? I want to be there compared to back talk and everything behind everybody's back saying, I can't believe he got it. I can't believe. No, like we've got to build our, our, in our rate 100. I know we moved to a 150, but like we've got to build our 100. So that way we actually have 40 or 50 guys in there, not 20. And as the guys that are in there now, we've got to do everything we can to pull people up and bring them along compared to saying, Hey, no, it's just us up here. Does that don't make sense? Yep. Can I add something? Go ahead, Marshall. Yeah. Um, as far as the moving up and all of that good stuff, and I was told this a long time ago, um, you should be happy for the individuals that do move up because believe it or not, them moving up gives those guys that aren't there the opportunity to move up because somebody has to fill that slot. So like you said, we should be happy for the individuals that get this game or go to this level uh, I'm going I'm to speak about Bob for a second, if y'all don't mind, Bob Hall. You know, he, he came to the chapter, and he moved up pretty quick. And Bob worked a very heavy high school schedule. But as he continued to progress and worked more in that Division I or college level, whatever he was doing, that gives opportunities to other people to move up. So I really don't – and a lot of times – for the young guys, you want people to move up, because that gives you an opportunity to fill that slot. Um, it gives you the opportunity to move up. What happens a lot of times in high school chapters and some college level is there's a stagnation, stagnation, stagnant that doesn't allow for that. But one thing with high school, it's there. So uh, if, say, Reggie gets selected for a college regional, that opens up a state tournament slot for somebody else because he's not available. Um, so one, if you want to be selfish, you can be selfish from that perspective. If he moves up, that gives me an opportunity to move that into that slot. Just wanted to add that. And I do, I say that jokingly, but it's the, it's the business because everybody can't work every game. You can't be two places at one time. Hey, Mark, Marvin. Yeah, Marvin. And when we talk about the moving up aspect, when someone moves up, that's a direct reflection on all of us for helping out these individuals to do the right thing so they're put in positions and they're getting uh, positive feedback from each and every one of you. Because without, without that, there would be little moving up. So we all play a part of our officials that advance to different levels in different ball games. And let me say one more final thing on 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 uh, on the process of moving up. Somebody's in the regional, somebody's in the state, whatever. I'm going to tell you how I look at it. I look at it. Uh, I'm going to use Rufus Lott as a, as an example. Rufus is moving up in the men's game, in the men's college game, and uh, and uh, he's getting some Division two games and and whatnot. I look at it. Rufus Lott is not taking away, taking anything away from me. I never think anyone is taking anything away from me. Uh, I'm looking at it as what I need to do in order to put myself in the position to uh, to be thought of to get more Division II games, to get a regional, to get to get a uh, a state game. What do I need to do? It's not what what they are doing is what I need to do in order to get the same consideration.
Hey, Mark. Hey, Ron. Hey, uh, I just want to add to it, too. Um, you know, being kind of a U1, U2, I'm, I'm crew chief some of the time. I, I, I've had an opportunity to work with most people on, these, on this uh, Zoom meeting. And I, I think as a chapter, at least from my perspective, we have done well as far as uh, – or as teaching and, and bringing people along. I think we definitely improved in the last couple of years for sure. Uh, I don't know if Henry's on this call, but you know, is, yeah. training team, yeah, they've done a real good job uh, because I've had a chance to work with some of the younger, younger guys. And I, I'll tell you a Mac story. So when I first came in, I, I knew Mac personally and he kind of took me under his wing and I had a middle school game with him probably in my second year. And he told me, I still remember it. He said, I, you know, I don't know if you're going to make it. I don't know if you're going to turn that corner. And I, I kind of <laughs> laughed, but, but, uh, and, and I thought to myself, you know, cause then I started in you know, front outside looking in, I didn't know that Mac was, you know, what he was in the officiating world. And so he kind of talked to me a little bit and I passed this on to, to younger officials too, is, uh, what we all talk about, uh, listen to advice and some of it's going to be bad. Some of it's going to be good. But, you know, listen to it, absorb it, flush the stuff you think you don't need. But if you hear the same advice and you're thinking it's bad over and over again, it may be good advice. You just think it's bad. Uh, and that's what Mac taught me. And so where I've got to my point in my career, as far as officiating, I, I credit to all you guys because I, I just listened. I listened and I took, took what I thought could help me and I tried to work on it. And I know that's probably how a lot of people came up. So, you know, I, I, I definitely appreciate it. And uh, what Marvin was saying, it, it, uh, I credit you guys for, for helping me out and getting me, you know, where, where I can officiate at the varsity level. So I think we've done a good job. And like I said, we're, I think we're getting better. And I don't see this, uh, this animosity towards people coming up uh, as, as much as I've seen in the past. Yeah, thanks, Ron. I'm, I'm gonna add, I was going to add something to later, but it all keeps coming up. So there's a lot of referees that are similar to that story, right? Uh, my, myself included, that we've, we've had great mentors and we've been able to progress to where we at. And we, every, everybody works a varsity schedule. But now we all have to understand what our role is in a chapter now. So, you know, I talk about Ron. Ron is typically, like he said, Brian Sinclair, U1, U2. Okay, well we need you guys to step up and start being referees, right? That's, this, is, this is the purpose of this is to then, okay, you've got the experience, right? What's the next step in everybody's refereeing career? And we all have different um, uh, levels to where we're at right now. You know, some of us have aspirations going here. Some of us are almost on our way out and then we want to give back. And those, so everybody has a different role in the chapter. And I think someone touched on it earlier. I think it was Marshall understanding your role in the game. Right. I even remember Brian Garland, when he told us a story at camp that he was saying that most of the time he's a crew chief. But if he goes to work with like D Cantor and another Final Four referee, well, he said, my ass is a U2. I'm going to stay out the way. I'm going to let them to do what they got to do. If a rule situation comes up, I'm going to make sure I know the rule. I'm going to make sure that I don't miss my plays. I'm going to be referee real good in my PCA. But then he understands the next night he may be working with two first, second year referees. Now we've got to be the crew chief and do everything else. So. That's something that I think um, we need to be more aware of. And then also where you are in your refereeing career, what's your next step? I was going to kind of close with that, but I'm glad Ron said it because, you know, I look at Ron, I look at um, Brian Sinclair, you know, got those guys like that, that I believe your next step is to step up. And I know you guys can do it. I know you want to be, want to be crew chiefs. Um, I am going to introduce Farron Williams. Farron's a good friend of mine. I went to high school together in Corpus. He's a training director down there. So he's jumped on all the Zoom meetings. Um, we know that Corpus and Bevo have had some stuff down there. So he's been talking to me a lot, and he's all about training, all about getting his referees better. I think there's a few of his um, crew chiefs on here as well, but he just sent me a note that he would like to, uh, to talk or have some questions. So Farron, go ahead, my man. I, I appreciate that, Mark. Um... I just wanted to, to, to just maybe get uh, some help as far as how do we uh, in the corpus uh, chapter allow officials um, to understand that they don't have to necessarily be on the same uh, growth time limit. We have some officials that feel like uh, you haven't done this long enough 
even though maybe what they put on the court shows that they're at a level where we can expect more from them just because they haven't been in the chapter, you know, the five to 10, 10 plus years, but the promise that they're showing on the court um, to, to be able to combat or to, to put them in a, in a situation where they can, they can feel that they can fast track their career. If that's something that they want to do as an official, that it's not necessarily a 10 year, five year, you got to follow this process or this protocol uh, or timeline to get where you want to be as an official. If you put in the work, and you're disciplined and you, you, uh, you're putting investment into your own craft, uh, that things can happen at a, at a more accelerated pace just because, you know, our, our veteran official, maybe it took them a certain amount of time. We, we, sometimes we, had, we hear the conversation, you know, we want to put them in a box because they haven't necessarily had the time on the court that they might not be ready for certain type of ball games. I just wanted to hear what, you, what, what kind of uh, response you might have to that type of, of thought process. I, I can touch on real quick, Farron, like our, our rate system kind of helps that. It helps that if a, a referee comes in and in the first couple of years is shows skills that they can work, you know, or schedule, they don't have to worry about being in the chapter five, six, seven, eight years as far as, um, as years of tenure, it's more their skill set. So I can just talk on that, that we, we, we've gone to the rate system in order to help that. So if we have referees, we, we're going more on skill set as opposed to longevity. Um, but I'll let some other uh, veterans or referees talk about how you would, uh, you know, how you would go about talking to that certain individual. Can I, can I add something there? Yeah. Uh, this is Marshall. Uh, what, the old military adage, time in service versus time in grade. Time in grade. I think we need to, if you're an up-and-comer, don't get caught up with time in service because sometimes you're in games and you're the younger official and you're not the referee, and you have a senior official who is the referee on paper, when you all go out on the court, you're all, all are referees. But in some cases, they put that U1 in there to strengthen the crew because the referee may bring other attributes to the game. I would not get caught up in time and service because like Mark mentioned, if you're, I would say the number one thing, and I keep going back to this, if you want to fast track, as you say, be a good play caller, be a good person that's knowledgeable in the rules um, and leadership fellowship. If I could share one story that happened on the court a couple of years ago with, in a playoff game with me up in Dallas. And when you talk about listening and, and being a, a decent R or whatever, I was working with a crew and uh, uh, we had a pregame dunk and Marvin may remember this, we had a pregame dunk and we adjudicated the rule incorrectly or we didn't apply it correctly. And the U1, U2 spoke up at halftime and we adjudicated it properly to start the second half. And that goes back to having courage, but at the same time, the referee being willing to listen and taking the feedback and having the courage to apply with that that co-official gave them. Um, Marvin, do you remember that? And Kenny, do you remember that? I think you might have been president at the time. But yeah, uh, uh, like I said, the main thing I, I think to fast track is be knowledgeable in the rules, be coachable, and be a good play caller. And it'll take care of itself. Thank you. Mar Marshall, I recall that. <laughs> I just text Frank. I just text Frank a message. You were in the game. <laughs> I recall so, that. So my, my response to what Farron was talking about is I think oftentimes when someone is new and up and coming and they're like this uh, energizer, energizer bunny that wants to get, get in the ring, right, um, is not to forget that there is no replacement for experience. Um, there just isn't. You got to have, you got to have time, right? You know, not that you can't do it quickly, but I think a lot of times when the, when, when the, the person that's already there, uh, when he feels the threat or she feels the threat, uh, then that, that may tend to creep in. I think we're very fortunate here. We don't have that same, because we're a military city, we get a lot of people that come in here um, all the time. And, and, you know, they'll, and they'll say, well, I know I have to wait four or five years before I do this. And the first thing we share with them, and, and it's true, that that's not true here uh, because we get people 
in all the time that, that have different levels of, ex of experience. And so just to, to remember to that we have to acknowledge that there's a, there's a, a hierarchy, but, but not to get caught up in you control what you can control. Uh, I, I think that's the, the, the best thing. Those, you know, the things I can control is like Mike said earlier, man, calling partners, getting there on time, doing those kind of things that, and, and being ready with the rules. I think, uh, what was Anthony, what was Anthony's last name in the NBA? He talked about that when he didn't get picked up. He said, what I, what did I do? I delved into my rules because that's one thing people can't take what my grandfather used to tell me that education, people can't take that or they can take your house away. They can take, but they can't take your education away. Right. And so once you've gotten that, you, you, you hold on to that. Hey, Baron, uh, this is Reggie. Uh, and Anthony's uh, name was Anthony Johnson, Kenny. Yeah, you're talking Anthony about Jonathan. You're talking about Jonathan Sterling. Y'all get to get your names right. Is Jonathan? No, no he said Anthony. Anthony. It was AJ. He said Anthony. Yeah. I'm it trying was, to call me out. I'm but trying it, to no, call it me was out, Mark. it was Jonathan Jonathan Sterling that didn't make it to the NBA. It was, got his it was a it was a real young kid. Yeah, yeah the guy with the ball head. <laughs> AJ is Anthony Jordan in the NBA. The ball AJ is right. That's right. That's no, Marshall's right. That's it's Anthony about. Jordan. If y'all don't mind. Okay, After sir. Jordan was an up and comer, real quick, and actually y'all are being combative. Yes. Yeah, actually, it was Anthony Jordan. He's from Atlanta, and he he was fast track. And this is sometimes the problem with fast track. And if I can speak honestly, uh, he was he was put in really good situations. A really good official, excellent official, FIBA official, but he no longer works in the NBA. Okay, uh, whatever that reason is, whatever it is, but. He's one of the top D1 FIBA officials out there. So AJ is Anthony Jordan, and he's actually okay. been around for okay. a while. Okay, okay, Farron, Farron, if I understood your question correctly, uh, I've been, I've always been. Anybody can who knows me, I've always been a proponent of of ability. If you have the ability to work a game, you should be working the game. Uh, I don't care if you're two years in. If you're, if you're a female working a boys game, if you have the ability to work that game, you should be in that game. Uh, back in the day, we were, uh, this, I'm talking about when I got here in 99, I was part of that process of where you had to have a certain amount of years to uh, get into the varsity level. I, I think those days are gone. Uh, Mark is an example of that. Rufus is an example of that in college. Uh, I think if you have the ability to work, Mike Daniels is, a, is, an, is, a, is an example of that. Mike Daniel is an example of that. Uh, if you have the ability to work a game, I don't care what level it is, regional, state, whatever, if you have the ability, there shouldn't be anybody saying anything about why is this guy, guy or girl in the game. And fair and last, like one of the other things you can tell the up and coming is when I moved down here, I moved down here in 01, so two years after Reggie. And John Hunt was our assigner at the time. And he used to say, I can get you into the game one time. You got to keep yourself there. Right? And so it's one of those that are up and coming, really being aware of where they're at and what they're capable of. You know, you can ask, I can get Marvin to assign Brian Sinclair a, a varsity 6A game where he's the crew chief and it's two – coaches that are going to go at it and if Brian shows up and he does a great job handles that game and is really good with the coaches he's going to get more opportunities with those with them but if he shows up and he has a bad game and he can't handle the coaches and all there's other coaches sitting there watching that game seeing what's going on and you're not getting just pulled out of that one you're getting pulled out of all of them because all those coaches are seeing you so is that up and coming official just knowing and you talking with that up and company official, hey, I'll work with you and we'll, we'll get you there. But careful what you ask for, because if you ask for it too quick, you could lose it all. Good point. I, I just hear y'all, I hear, I hear a lot of y'all just saying that, um, you know, the San Antonio chapter is, is trying to change the culture. And we're kind of in that same mindset, uh, kind, of, kind of going through the same growing pains right now in the midst of trying to change our culture and, and um, get more than just, you know, our 15 to 20. Um, officials that can go just trying to grow that in a lot. We have a big gap as far as years of experience uh, from 
the officials that are calling a, a normal varsity schedule and it kind of drops down drastically. We have almost, you know, the same amount of first, second, third year officials, officials that we do of the more veteran officials. So I was just trying to, you know, get some advice on how to have that conversation uh, moving forward with, with, uh, with the guys that we have down here. I appreciate all the, the, the tips of that. Yeah, you're doing a great job down there, Farron. Keep keep doing what you're doing, man. Uh, Mike Daniel, go ahead. I know you wanted to say something. I do. Uh, it's a story that kind of goes with Farron and, and the culture of things. The first thing is for the culture to change as a chapter, we all have to adopt something and we have to remove the negativity. Like I said earlier, negativity is cancer. And so when that conversation comes up about why is this person in that game, the next question should be, why are you worried about that game? <laughs> like it has no bearing on you. That's first thing. Second thing is take ownership for yourself. For instance, true story, uh, four years ago, uh, when I just started my organization here in San Antonio, it was, I was doing my trainings on Sundays and I never forget Matt called me to work on Sundays at Churchill, but it was during the time of my training and I couldn't do it. Well, I wasn't getting any varsity games and I didn't know what the heck was going on. And so I reached out, I talked to Mosley cause me and Mosley, you know, Mac and Mo have known me since I was a kid. And Mose told me straight up, he said, man, Mac thought you wasn't serious. He said, you can't talk about it. You gotta be about it. And it's all about showing your action. And so what I learned is I talked to some of the veterans, Reggie, Marshall, Kenny, Marvin, and they said, you have to show that you want to be there. It's all about your own. And so when we start taking our own ownership and take our own accountability, my question wasn't, why is that person on the court? My questions became, what do I need to do to get to that court? When we start asking those questions and deflecting the negative questions, when people and deflecting those negative conversations, the culture will change because if one person goes to five different people with a negative statement and trying to engage negative conversations and five people turn that person away, that person's either going to eventually shut the hell up or they're going to realize, man, maybe I need to change my mindset. And just like in my classroom, we have to change our mindsets, which will then enable us to grow our mindsets. And that's what it boils down to. Just some thought. Good stuff. Totally agree. All right. Last, last question for everybody. We'll close on this. We'll try to get done in, by 730. So appreciate everybody's feedback. Like we've heard from people that we haven't heard from in the last two months, which is phenomenal. I, I just love hearing from other people. Everybody's voice should be heard um, because we don't know what you're going through, right? Or what you see and all those type of things. But the last question is how can we individually and as a group improve as crew chiefs? So we've gone over what is good, what is bad. I think we're all very consistent on that. We've learned a lot of good traits and bad traits, but how do we put that into effect? It's easy to say it. I want us to leave here with a mindset. What are we going to do? Change the culture, but what are those things that we can do to improve us as referees and being crew chiefs? I'll start, Mark, and I'll just say that we need to be willing. And you can finish the be willing any way you want. And we can all throw what we're willing to do. Are we willing to look at ourselves? Are we looking at how we can better communicate, how we can be better, lead? whatever it is. We just need to be willing. I'll leave it at that. Anyone else? Marvin, preparation. We, we need to be better prepared and by doing that, we have to get in our rules books, mechanics manuals, uh, game management skill issues, and be better prepared so that uh, when we all meet at the game site, our uh, message is a very good message and we all get on the same sheet of page. I, uh, for me, I, as I'm listening, I think that we have to do this type of we have to have this kind of discussion more because then it helps us get on the same same page, having this discussion, being honest about in, in this kind of environment, not when we're out, you know, cutting it up at, you know, at Chili's, so to say, but something where we're like focused in on on each other and what and, and the things that we're talking about. I know for me, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm as I'm listening, I'm always also looking at, okay, what am I going to do? What am I going to do different to take my, um, crew chief for responsibilities more seriously. Thanks, Dwayne, go ahead. Hey. Uh, 
you know, for me, and it, it's something that Diana's working on, but it's, um, it's not just us here being involved in these, in these meetings. We got to, we got to work on changing the culture for the chapter in its entirety. I mean, we got a lot of people that are not part of these meetings that are, are, are crew chiefs, right? So they're still working in that old mindset. So we got to, we got to be working on not just, I mean, this is a good start, but we got to be willing to, like Frank said, be willing to change that, that culture, to change that mindset. And it, it, maybe it starts with the meetings. Maybe it starts with training. Maybe it starts with whatever we need to do. Uh, but working on changing that, that culture overall to get to a better position as a chapter. Anyone else? Thanks, Dwayne. I, I, I just want to say we got to be more consistent right with everything that everyone's saying like be willing to do this be consistent step up and then what i want to do during the season is i talked about this with ddr is getting clips to crew chiefs every week so i thought some of you heard 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 this before but i wanted to, to go over it again so for example we get into the season okay and you know i, I watch a lot of a lot of games a lot of clips and just say that we have a trend that we're missing perimeter travels. That's just say first week we're, we're, we're missing a bunch of split steps or you know pivot foots, whatever it is, we're missing travels. So then the following week on a Tuesday and a Friday or whatever it would be, you, I would send out clips to the crew chief and say, hey, here's two clips for you to go over this week or three clips to go over. And they're gonna be from our game. Now, what do we as crew chiefs, we're highly consistent, we're going over trends, and then we've got things to say, this has happened last week, and possibly you could have those teams at night. I'm not going to say that's going to change the way that you call, but it will have some awareness on, oh, this team, you know, their footwork's not great on the perimeter, let's watch it in pre-games, those type of things. But just, those are something that I would like to do, because we don't do that. that I think that can only help as us, as, as again, or we can have more Zoom meetings, or we can have emails and those type of things, but I think us being more consistent as crew chiefs, because um, I know... Is that you, Bob? Is that your kids going crazy in the backyard? Yeah. Um, um, that's what I think. I think can help because we've been a part of pregame. Some of them are, some of them are really good. Some of them, it's just like, okay, that, that's what we're doing tonight. You know, that's what we're doing today. So I think changing the culture. Everyone said it, it, it's good, but I think just being more consistent and then using the tools that we have. So if anybody would like to add to that, but that, that's the idea that I have. I talked to Marvin about it, Diana, about getting clips to crew chiefs every week on trends, um, I think would be something that would be beneficial. Reggie, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, that's some good stuff, Mark. Uh, I would like to add something that nobody's uh, touched on as yet. Uh, and this is back to officiating. This is back to being a crew chief. And uh, that is being willing to do what you expect others to do. I'm going to give you some examples. And this has a lot to do with crew chiefs. Crew chiefs should be expected to handle the sidelines, to handle any uniform issues, or whether that's leading. Okay? So if, because I've been in, in with other crew chiefs, and they, they have not done this. They will ask you to do it, but then, they, then when it gets their turn to do it, they won't do it. So being unafraid, to, uh, to, to ask the assistant coach to sit, because by rule, the assistant coach needs to be seat, seated, seated. The bench, being aware of the bench being up. These are the type of things, shirt tails in, I'm the only one on the, on the court telling somebody when to tuck their shirt in. Okay, that's that type of thing. I'm not gonna ask a U1 or a U2 to do something that I'm not gonna do, okay? so. If you're unaware of it, and I and I as a crew chief ask you, you know, hey, you know, I can't do it from center opposite. I can't tell the assistant to sit down from center opposite. So if you're over there on the table side, be cognizant of, of the coach standing up, the coach is on the floor, those type of things. These are the type of things that I'm going to take care of. And so if I, if we as crew chiefs expect our U1s and U2s to do things we should be willing to do those same things. Can, can I add to that, Reggie, if you don't mind? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, that's, that's so true. You, as a crew chief and even further, just being an official, 
you have to do the things that are not, uh, as I could say, uh, favorable or well-liked. And unfortunately, sometimes we, we have to do that. And for example, with uniforms, and as we say, culture, I love that everybody's talking about culture now. This is something that we've been talking about for a while. One thing that we can control is uniforms, right? If we as a chapter build a culture that we want the uniform right, then those are the steps that we can make to consistency. And that's an easy thing. Uh, and you've got to have the courage to do that. Uh, I remember several years ago, I, a comment was made to me, oh, you're the, you're the uniform ref. Well, no, it's the rules. But like I said, if we want to build a culture, then we have to do things consistently. And I just used the uniform as an example uh, and going further in the bench decorum and things of that nature. That's building a culture. Uh, let's not talk about it. Let's be about it. Thank you. Agreed. Amingo, you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to add a couple of things. Uh, we got to remember that our chapter is a high school chapter, okay? First and foremost. And I've been listening to a lot of guys and, you know, it's like when the veteran guys talk to the newer guys, uh, we got to remind that the up and coming guys, we're doing a high school game. And sometimes you'll have some guys that will chime in with some college stuff. And to me, that's kind of confusing to a new and up and coming person because to them, they're trying to learn high school. And at the same token, they're getting, they're hitting a little bit in their ear about college. And, don't get me wrong, I have nothing against guys that do college or any other level above this. Uh, we just got to remind ourselves that we're going to be good officials, good referees. We got to remember we're doing high school balls, high school mechanics, and high school rules. That's how we're going to be good teachers with our chapter. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, like I said, I'm not trying to uh, knock anybody down, but uh, if we're going to be good referees, good leaders, we got to remember that we are a high school chapter and we need to focus and getting these guys coming up learning high school first before they even aspire to do anything above high school. That's all I got to say. Okay. Thanks, thanks Bingo. Um, all right. Yeah. Who's, hey, who's up? Mark. Hey, Bob. Uh, real quick. Hey, so. We all, you know, this is, isn't necessarily hundred percent crew chief. You know, um, I'm not, I don't remember who said, I think Dwayne said it. Hey, we got a whole bunch of people that aren't on these meetings and trying to get everybody in with trying to take, you know, I love your ideas, sending out clips, but to me, the clips should be sent to everyone that's a varsity official. Somebody that's calling varsity games that week should be getting those clips give everybody the opportunity or the expectation is that the crew chief is going to take those clips and in, clips into the locker room. And we're going to look at those clips and talk about those clips. But if the, if the other officials have already seen it, but then I don't know if it's possible. I mean, it's always possible, but it's some of us stepping up because Mark, you're doing a ton, but some of us stepping up to say, Hey, I want to hold a zoom meeting for the three hundreds. Mm -hmm. or I want to do it for the 200s and, you know, whatever that is and picking stuff to work on with them, but giving them an uh, invitation to say, Hey, this is for you. These are the crew chiefs. This is for you guys. because We want to make you better because if they're better, it makes us our officiating even easier uh, because the better they get, the easier it is for us to the referee, but they're also going to challenge us and, and push us as well. So yeah. thank you. No, I, I totally agree. This was a, um, cause I, I'll be honest. I heard like, oh man, y'all are doing this for crew chiefs only. What about everybody else? Okay. Well, we've got to start at the top. That was my, that's what, that was my thought process behind this. Let's start with the leaders of the chapter or who need to step up and be leaders. Then we can start to funnel all the way down because you know, at a 300 or 400 brand new referee, they don't think that they have a voice as much as, you know, everybody that's possibly on this zoom call. So I totally agree with um with Bob. That's something that we need to do. We need to continue to to teach and develop and have these these meetings. But for me, it just kind of starts at at the top. What I did want to do for the next meeting was is continue on this this topic of crew chiefs and then get into more not necessarily clips, but in game situations. Like I, I like what Reggie and Marshall were touching on as far as uniforms and bench decor. We're not consistent as that. 
how many games have we been to when we as soon as we walk in, we're like, okay, they're gonna allow them to wear the wrong coat, the wrong shirts underneath, and that kid's got those tights on and that sleeve and that, and then it just right away you notice it. And then the next game, guess what we do? We take care of it, and then once the coaches are pissed off, they're griping. I I've got text messages and, and emails like they let us do it this game, Mark, and the next group said they didn't. I mean, it's just if we just take care of it, like to, to everybody's point, do what we're supposed to do, have the courage and step up, then we just don't have the issues that we have. So I think that's the next one. The next meeting we have is we're going to start diving into more in-game situations, players, how we have issues with players, with coaches, um, how we communicate with them, how some communicate too much, some don't communicate at all, as all, and just being highly consistent with what we do in the game. I like the conversation we've had to start it off, but we could do this for hours and hours, but I do want to close because we're at 7.30. Um, that was what I would like to, to touch on our next meeting. I don't know when it'll be, I'll let you know, but I think that would be a good stepping point going forward on getting into more specific situations that you've had in the game or you can share. A lot of us have been in a lot of tough ball games with tough coaches, with tough kids, with tough fans, you know, bad table crews, you know, you, you name it. We've got a lot of stories that we have that can only if we share that we can help. I tell you, the most that I've ever learned in my life is going to Applebee's with Mac, Reggie, Rufus, and Marshall, and just listening to these guys talk about games. I'm like, God, you guys have been in some battles, some wars, but you just learned so much about how they handled it, those type of situations, and how we can get better. So that's what I would like to touch on. If anybody else has a different direction to go in next meeting, uh, let me know, but I think that's where I would like to head, but uh, open for feedback what the group would like to do. <clears throat> okay. I didn't hear anybody giving no thumbs down. Okay. All right. I appreciate you guys so much for being on. I think this has been highly effective. Uh, Farron, I thank you for jumping on and you guys in Corpus and all that. I hope this was helpful for you. I have, this is recorded. So you can just let me know. I'll throw it up on YouTube. I send it to you for the, for the ones that didn't get on. Let's try to get it in their hands. I'm still going to send the email to those people that didn't get it on because it's more about the information than anything. Who it, no matter who it comes from, information is, is highly important. And I'm going to send you that link for a crew chief. It's great. I mean, but it takes some time to go through it, but I'll, I'll get that to you guys as well. Um, again, I, thank you so much. This has been awesome. I appreciate all great dialogue, so much information, people talking. It's, it's, been the probably one of the most productive zoomings I think I've been a part of. So thank you. Um, hit me up if you've got any questions or anything. We'll be in touch. All right. Stay safe. Take take care as well.